It's like Dexter. Right? Right. The serial killer, contemptible object and ever eternally fascinating. It's the same sort of thing. You know, and so there's disgust and attraction at the same time. So That, well, that's a good question. So, alexithymia is a hypothetical psychiatric condition that's, that consists of the inability to articulate emotional states. It's a good question because it depends on the degree to which your personality has to be articulated in order to be functional. And one of the things I would propose to you, and this is partly why we're doing the exercises that we're doing, is that just like, imagine that if your joints weren't articulated, it's not very helpful because you could just sort of slap things with your hands, you know, they'd be like paws but they're fully articulated and there's a conceptual relationship between articulated speech and articulation articulated speech means that your tools for dealing with the world are more differentiated perceiving, acting in the world and so the more you can articulate yourself the more of you there is, the more the world there is and hypothetically that's a good thing so if you're, if you're without terms for emotions, pretty damn hard to communicate Yes. Um, yeah, maybe standing for for bliss and falling intuition and kind of trying to tap into. The yeah, well, a big part, a big part of the New Age movement is in fact a reaction against rationalist nihilism. So, and to that degree, there's some utility in it, but the problem is, is that it's sort of like Protestantism without the devil. The world is all good. Well, no, wrong. That's not even close to right. The world is a horrible place, and people are terrible creatures. But that's not the whole story, right? Because the world is also a wonderful place, and people are amazing creatures. So, but I think that's another answer to the ideology question, too, is that in my understanding, a philosophy that unites the opposites, which is kind of a Jungian idea, is not an ideology. So here's an ideology. Human beings are despoiling the planet, Western culture does nothing but rape and pillage, and nature is a, a innocent, virginal victim. It's like, yeah, that's all true. But it's, it's only half true, because human beings are all also unbelievably interesting and remarkable creatures, and it's no bloody wonder that we're trying to survive, and that has costs. And Thank God for culture, because otherwise, you know, it was minus 10 last night, so we'd all be popsicles. And nature is doing everything it possibly can at every moment to destroy and undermine us. So it's like, okay, you want an ideology, you can pick the first one, that's an environmental ideology. The second one is like a frontier myth. So you put them together and you've got nature is terrible and beautiful, and culture is tyrannical and provides security, and the human being is you know, a remarkable exploratory hero and an absolutely satanic figure and then you've got the whole thing, not quite, because there's one other category that, that is sort of like the category from which all those categories emerge it's a very low level category but as far as I can tell a system that has representations of those classes of phenomena is not an ideology belief systems have a dogmatic element and a transformative element and they're always at war because one the, the dogmatic element constrains the revelatory element and the revelatory element undermines the dogmatic element but they're both necessary so it's a very it's a form of dialogue it's the best way to think about it there's got to be a dialogue in belief systems between the structure and the process of updating the structure and, and any belief system can err too much one way or the other. And the only reason, way that you can figure out if you're erring is by paying attention and, and, and communicating. So, and if you want a definition of religion, well, you know, that's not a straightforward thing to do, but I would say that you have, a, you have axioms of belief. And your axioms, whatever they are, are religious entities for you, whether you know it or not because you hold them as absolutely true and, and 
you have insufficient evidence for anything. So, you know, this is a Kierkegaardian idea. You are by necessity a creature of faith. And the reason for that is, there isn't much of you and there's a lot of the world. And so you have to make assumptions in order to move forward. And you might think, well, I don't make assumptions. And then I would say, well, when you cross the street, you're making an assumption. The assumption is that the other side of the street is a better place to be than this side of the street you're already on. So that's an assumption. You know, maybe you're going to get hit by a bus as you cross. You know, so much for that axiom. But you just can't move forward without making assumptions because if you question everything all the time, then you're paralyzed, you're in chaos. So, so I'm wondering then, um, sort of the believing in, in your objective way, um, the stories rather than seeing them as myths and understanding the story, is how that's different from the negative side of an ideology, which can be extremely dangerous. So taking that story... Excellent question. Well, that's partly what we're going to talk about, a lot. Um, it's the difference between... It's like the difference between surfing and being in a styrofoam bubble on a lake. You know, there's a dynamic element. So if I say, well, if, if you're going to identify with the process of transformation... I'm, first of all, I'm not saying that's all you should identify with. That's, that's a different question. It might depend on where you are and what you're doing and at what stage of life you are and all sorts of other things. But to the degree that you identify with the process that transforms belief systems, you're not an ideologue. It's as simple as that, because an ideologue is a totalitarian. They say, well, here's the bloody axioms, here's the system it generates, we're done. So, you're not done. And you've left things out. Now, that doesn't mean you don't need structure to move forward. Right? So it's a tricky thing. But you can say, that's why I'm trying to communicate to you the idea that it's better to conceptualize a belief system as a set of tools. They don't have to be perfect. You know, you can, you can fix a pipe with a pretty lousy wrench. So you've got tools at your disposal and you shouldn't abandon them. I mean, thank God for the tools, you know. But if you can think up a better tool, it's more power to you. So. Might not help them, it might knock them right out of the bloody thing into a pit. Yeah. I mean, I've had fundamentalist Christians in my classes before, you know, yeah. and, and it's pretty, it rattles them up pretty hard because they implicit, they're kind of funny, they're sort of like the rational atheists. They tend to think of the religious system as a theory about objective reality. It's so funny because they, they both share that, they both share the same presupposition. And so, you know, I outline evidence that it's not. Yeah. And that, that often is extraordinarily hard on their fundamentalist viewpoint. Yeah. So, but that's okay with me. It's like... Yeah. And presumably they could get over that, or if it wasn't, um, or if they weren't too far along the end of being fundamentalist. Um, a lot of, because an assumption is that, like, over time, as we, we came to re-understand belief, but, like, as a culture, and then that probably affected the, the core of the belief system, like, right in the religion, too, so that it's not even there fully understanding what beliefs are actually helping them live their lives. Oh, definitely not. Like, I mean, all of you people in this class are un unconscious advocates of ancient religious ideas. Like, I don't care whether you know it or not. It's like, because otherwise you run into Dostoevsky's conundrum. If there's no absolute morality, he really meant if there's no God, then you can do anything you want. Everything's up for grabs. And so the question is, do you run around doing anything you want? Or you can say, well, you don't because you're afraid. It's like, pff, fine, you can take that avenue, I don't care. That just puts it outside of the context of this argument altogether. Why do you act morally? Why should you? Why shouldn't you lie to get what you want? Or, why should, or, or should you? Why shouldn't you steal to get what you want? Or kill to get what you want? Why not? 
There's got to be answers to these questions. Obviously, every three-year-old knows that if you lie carefully, you can get what you want. So why not do it? All the time. Why not practice it until you're great at it? 